Our uh, young patient has missing uh, what you call the 1516, which are really number three and, and four. <coughs> the area of number four uh, has been grafted by um, a previous uh, dentist, um, and we are assuming that the graft material was um, either autogenous or uh, banked bone. Uh, needless uh, to say, you can actually see right on the uh, radiograph here, if I can zoom in a little bit, right there. Um, this is a 6 by 5.7 millimeter uh, implant uh, template, um, and you can see that it is barely fitting within the confines of the available native bone. So our plan is to perform a small um, uh, internal sinus lift, but the real fun happens in the more posterior area where the bone is between two and three millimeters at the widest in the most mesial part of that. And in this area, uh, the crest, as you will see clinically in a minute, uh, is actually narrow. So the plan is to perform a floor transport sinus lift, taking advantage of the narrowness of the crest and placing a, the uh, sinus lift uh, at the same time as the implant. So as you can see, it's relatively wide. There is, however, a scar right, well, right there. And this is the area of the uh, socket of number four, or one five, okay? And the intent is to expose the crest going from the uh, palatal slope all the way to the full buccal slope. I will use a papilla sparing technique. However, in the distal, I may not, only because the space is so tight, okay? I favor as continuous a, uh, an incision as possible. Don't like uh, angles and uh, connecting and lines. I'll move it in a minute. Use a little blunt dissection. See where the flap is lifting or, or not. Then I'll take a periosteal elevator and sort of <coughs> peel it back. You okay, Arthur? You all right? Good. Okay, Selden, please. Thank you. And I'll take a retraction suture next. Okay. So, um, this graft is definitely not uh, bank bone. This is more, um, could be naos, could be uh, whatever. Take this off. Some of it is incorporated, some of it is sloughing off. Either way, we should have enough to uh, place our implant. The way I'm going to proceed just for uh, your, uh, basically, um, understanding is to uh, first collect a little bit of uh, blood from the surgical site, which we will use in the graft, that way avoiding uh, a vene puncture, which is Obviously not a big deal, but uh, that way you could see how easy it is to collect what you need. We don't need a lot, but we'll collect as much as possible. And uh, this will be left aside until we mix it with the uh, synthograph. How do you stop the uh, blood clotting? Oh, I don't. I don't. It's going to clot eventually, right? We let it clot, and then we will uh, break up the clot into the um, the bone, excuse me, the, the bone graft. This, I think, creates um, sort of a, a favorable environment to stimulate more inflammatory response in the area. 
which uh, I think enhances the, the healing. Um, usually, uh, however, you know, we, we work relatively quickly. Um, you know, you don't have a completely congealed clot. However, in this case, because I am talking we'll, and we're filming, we're going to have a seriously congealed clot. We will add some more uh, blood in the, in the end. So we're using a retraction suture for sort of uh, convenience and visibility. Good. And then move it. So first of all, I take a straight cue right. I want to see how much of the graft has coalesced and how much hasn't. So I'll take a straight cue right and we will uh, try to dig out all of the uh, loose bone. It looks all right. OK, so now for the placement of the uh, initial pilot hole. <coughs> OK. The, the Bicon pilot burr, as you know, is a twist drill. It's okay, I can move it. Okay, it goes at 1100 RPM or so, and it's done under irrigation. Okay, so we will advance very slowly. I am now at six millimeters. So I expect to be another maybe millimeter or so before I get into, but because I'm angling uh, palatally, I may stay, get some more. So before we commit to the final size suction, take a paralleling pin. <coughs> And we check the angulation. Okay, let's see. Turn more to the left, please. Turn more to the left, Arthur. Thank you very much. Okay, so <coughs> the um, ring at the top of the, um, oh, excuse me, in the middle, of the paralleling pin is actually slightly over three millimeters, about three and a half. So if this fits, odds are we will be able to get an implant in there, okay? I'm gonna continue now with the pilot um, drill. Action. So I'm feeling resistance. I am almost at eight, about seven. And and just at eight, more water. Okay, I am good now. I think I just, well, I, I just lost resistance, okay? And there was a bit of a step. So we double check our um, position as every time you, you uh, use the pilot hole, you can change it and it's still unchanged, so we will continue now. We'll switch the handpiece, and I'm gonna step back. I won't uh, ream beyond uh, about seven millimeters. Yeah, medium's good. <coughs> and we are using the medium length latch reamers. I'm at six, and just beyond that. Okay, as you see, not much bone coming out yet. What's going to happen now, because the socket is mostly um, a very loose osteoid and bone graft, uh, the osteotomy is going to be transposed distally. So where, where our pilot hole was is actually not the center of the implant, 
is going to be the mesial edge of the implant, which works out fine. Either way will be okay, but this way actually will give us a good uh, spacing from the mesial tooth, from number five or one four. I have to translate for you. See, it's such a special occasion. We're getting all new reamers for you guys. I hope you appreciate the beautiful colors. <laughs> So there's really not much to it. You can ask Pete what, uh, what the uh, reamer feels as it's going in and dragging itself in to the osteotomy. We are at four and a half now, and the, the goal is to get to uh, five diameter implants. Okay. Now before I go to the final size, I'll take a straight and finish it up by hand. Take a straight uh, curette first. Then I'll take the hand reamer to finish off the osteotomy. So what I'm, uh, yeah, five. Suction this. So I still have a floor, it's always a good thing. And we want to remove all of this excess bone. We don't want to compact it against the bottom if we don't need to. Do we have the, the uh, beveled uh, sinus floor uh, osteotome? Yes, we might need to use that. Arthur, are you okay? Mm -hmm. No pain, right? No. Okay. Good. So, finishing up by hand. Yeah. Okay. So this is a hand reamer, obviously, using it by hand and. The, the reason why we're, we're, although it appears that I could probably go even uh, wider, is that the bone here is all grafted, and it's starting to, to uh, break a little bit to open up. So I don't want to strain it. Five, five by six, or five by eight will be fantastic. So again, before we go to the um, sinus lift, we will verify that our floor is, is still intact. No holes, perforations, or otherwise. Then when I will start using the osteotomes, for the sinus floor osteotome that is, uh, Janet or Alyssa will be supporting the facial skeleton by bracing the nose. All right. So um, incidentally, this is the new, the Bicon so-called trumpet osteotome. Okay, we designed this about, oh, I think two years ago or so. It is five millimeter at the top, just under five, maybe 4.9 or so. Uh, but it's, a, uh, it's um, wider at the tip, which allows me two things, to spread the energy of the tapping to uh, create sort of a manhole cover at the top or the bottom of the osteotomy that will be wider, which, would allow, which limits the uh, possibility of tears or reduces it anyway. And uh, also I can direct it uh, one way or another to favor one side. So in this case, because the mesial bone is a little thicker, I'm going to tap till we get into the floor. And I should be hitting the floor or just above the floor at about six, which is exactly where we are. And then I'm going to aim a little bit distally. So that way I tap more against the, the mesial and palatal. You hear the difference in the sound? I hope you did, because now already we've we caught we created the little fracture. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is take my bone graft and it's a half a gram. Okay, how much bone did we get from there? Okay, so this is the. Uh, a little bit of clot with a little bit of bone that we collected from the osteotomy so far. We will expand this with half a gram of synthograft fine. 
Okay. Now what I will do is mix them all together to create a putty-like grafting substance and mix it quite a bit. <coughs> and the one decision I want to make uh, is do I use a 5 by 8 or a 5 by 6 uh, in there? And I think to show you the, the uh, sinus lift better, 5 by 6 will, will need a slighter, a smaller 5 um, uh, internal lift. But to show you the internal lift more, I'll use a 5 by 8. It will show the uh, possibility. So let me have a 5 by 8, please. So please understand that a 5 by 6 is adequate. Uh, but it will, uh, a 5 by 8 will be, uh, will show the um, lift a little bit more. So would you please mix this some more, Janet? <coughs> yes. Johnny, how do you know you haven't got a tear in that membrane? I prayed before I came in this morning. <laughs> Why don't you invest in a little loop with a five or six times magnification and a five optic light and look in there? Do you have the money? I'm sure I do. <laughs> Actually. I'm sure yes. this will buy one. We'll take donations from South Africa. Diamonds will be preferred. <laughs> now let's be serious. You don't know there isn't a tear. What I do is I look in there. Once I've done that tapping, I look to see that there's no tear. Okay. Well, you could you could um, check it several ways. Okay. Uh, first of all, I could go with the curette very gently and feel it. So when I feel it there, okay, that's one. Okay. The other way we can ask our patient, I'll pinch his nose and I'll ask him to blow slightly. If we see bubbles of, uh, you know, red bubbles, that's it. So, Arthur, blow your nose very, very, very slightly. No, just a little bit, just a little bit, okay? Okay, no bubbles, no air coming out. So yeah, there's no tear. Are you satisfied with that? Yes, okay. And, and, it's, and it's free. <laughs> it's free. <laughs> Okay, so now to place the, uh, the graft in there, we will um, turn our attention. Actually, what I'm going to do, only because I don't want to traumatize the area too much, is uh, go ahead and, and put the graft and the uh, implant in. Now, you could do it two ways. You could put, uh, you can wait, do the osteotomy for the uh, other implant, and then... Uh, finish up the two together, placing the implants. This is a four millimeter tip carrier. It's usually, these are used for amalgams, but uh, uh, we never use it for amalgam. We always use it to carry bone grafting when I need it. So what I will do as a rule of thumb is fill this osteotomy. Okay, but before I do that, I get to the bottom and wiggle it and push the graft in. The graft itself will start oozing into uh, the sinus right beside the floor, the, the little um, uh, floor, a sort of a manhole cover as I like to call it, and that will start the sinus lift. Okay, and now, that's enough I think, put quite a bit in there, all this. Now I'll put the implant in. And using an inserted retriever is the most predictable and easiest way. <coughs> okay, so the implant is now going to be um, placed on the inserted retriever. Okay, and initially I'll thread it in just by twisting and pushing and this gentle twisting and pushing can be very effective however the final seat will be gentler if done with slight tapping with a surgical mallet you okay Arthur mm -hmm. he certainly woke you up this morning right he says I know okay so now that it is in the right position okay 
about two millimeters or so. I probably want to see it a little bit more. I will take the inserting point. Now, I wouldn't do this if I don't have good friction. And since we have a, quite a bit of bone, I could use this uh, tip. And this will allow me to see where the implant is seated. Okay, and I want the bevel, this point, it's not focusing on, the bevel to be right about the level of the bone, mesiodistally at least, okay? So it is fine on the mesial, it needs to go just a little bit more, maybe a millimeter on the distal, and here we go, okay? I'm happy with the placement of the implant now. We will place our black healing plug. You can place it in and cut it, or you can cut it outside. Uh, the reason I like to cut it outside is um, it's less likely to fall into the patient's throat. But, and we can also aim at the assistant. Okay. And so using just a standard periodontal probe, there is a little hole in the black healing plug, and we pop it in. Okay? So the first one is finished. Shoddy? Yes? Shoddy? We have a question. The, the make of the, the plastic tip, it's not actually plastic, I think it's Teflon, isn't it? The, it's, poly, it's carbon filled polyethylene, which is not Teflon, no. It's carbon filled polyethylene. Biocompatible. Biocompatible. It is biocompatible uh, indefinitely by okay. the FDA. Any more questions? Everybody's gone silent. Now, what I need to do is do a, uh, a floor window for the floor transport osteotomy. And for that, I need my uh, ridge split osteotomes. Now, the idea is to place a six millimeter wide implant. So for that, we have to make the sides of the window, the, the narrower sides of the rectangle, if you will, the width of the rectangle, less than six, obviously. And, and the easiest way to do that for me is to use an osteotome, a chisel, that is less than six. So I use the width of this osteotome to make uh, the uh, rectangle, okay? So uh, I might need you to retract a little bit more. This way. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, that's nice. Okay, good. And your hand is out of the way. Lovely. Okay, suction. The other uh, important aspect of it is to leave um, myself enough room away from uh, the implant and also away from the tooth and away from the flap. So you got a bit of a um, sort of juggling act here. So distally, I'm going to leave myself just about two millimeters from the edge of the flap. And a little bit of tapping, Arthur, are you okay? Mm -hmm. And you're really not doing uh, a lot of, uh, you know, cutting, you more scoring that bone, all right? And now with the mesial end. So I'm going to do the narrower sides and try to get as big a rectangle as possible. Okay, and it's pretty soft. The bone is pretty soft now. So now these, I don't want to be, be outside of the confines or the length of my osteotome, which is five. That way I can guarantee that the flap, now, that the uh, window is narrow enough to support the implant. Here's the uh, distal cut, posterior cut. Okay. Here is the lateral or uh, buckle cut. I want to make sure we're right on. And we're really not cutting, although I'm using that term. We're really more scoring the crest so that when I start moving the window, okay, it will move where I want it to and not propagate uh, more than I want it. Okay, now we're doing the medial cut or the palatal cut. And the main reason this technique works is because of the plateau design of the Bicon implant where a blood clot and bone graft will heal 
just as fast and give us a predictable osseo integration as would another type of implant in fully healed mature bone. So that's the reason why we're able to use uh, this kind of technique. <laughs> now that I've made all the cuts, I've just got to make sure the media, the front one, suction here, the anterior cut is redeveloped. And this is the one that's coming uh, against the anterior slope, if you uh, remember from the x-ray. Okay, now I will go with a flat top osteotome, which we normally use for um, sinus floor elevation anyway. And this is a three millimeter one, and I want to aim at the corners, because these are the ones that are hardest to mobilize. And we start tapping, and we see what happens. We may need to refine or redefine our cuts. It takes a bit of work. So for this technique, suction more. Uh, patience is absolutely essential. You gotta stay out of my way there. Okay. And then suction here. She's moving your elbow, not your wrist. Okay. Are you okay, Arthur? Mm -hmm. A lot of banging, but you should be okay. system, but there's a lot of hanging going on. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> yes, well, you, you uh, with the Bicon system, you don't get screwed, you get hammered. <laughs> I love it. When I tell an old joke to new people, it's like, uh, you know, the new joke to me, right? <laughs> So again, we go back and refreshen our cuts. Okay. And again, we go back. And it's starting to mobilize in the posterior edge. So I gotta freshen up the uh, anterior cut. <laughs> Here we go. Can you see it? Can you see the? Um, can you get a little more light with this one? You see how the uh, rectangle just started moving into the sinus or really the alveolar process which has been occupied by the sinus expansion so it is key to wait a little bit because what happens now there's a little bit of uh, you know swelling and inflammation happening from the um, uh, lifting of the sinus membrane a little bit of bleeding give it time to sort of release and relax and then we will uh, start putting pushing it up what I will use next is the five millimeter, um, or maybe even the four millimeter floor transport or, or uh, sinus floor osteotome, okay, and tap this up just a little bit more, okay. Again, a lot of uh, patience, take your time. But now I have enough movement away, enough, enough room for, my, for uh, being able to start the actual uh, osteotomy. So now I will just use a slightly wider osteot or uh, reamer. Okay, this is a four and a half. And we will start just carrying it in there. Okay, not much happening yet. The five millimeter hand reamer again. My uh, vision for this is to have the uh, hand reamers. Oh, he's not calling it my head anymore, only my hair. Sorry about that. 
Well, exactly. I'm, I'm happy to hear that I still have hair to get in the way. Okay. So, the procedure now will expand the walls, the uh, palatal and buccal wall. We'll use the sight dilator of five and a half. Okay. So, this is an uh, implant sight expander, 5.5 millimeters. And and some more tapping. Okay, so that's pretty tight, which is exactly what I want. Okay, don't suction too far in there. I'll take the uh, six millimeter hand reamer, then I'll six millimeter dilator. So again, now I'm going to switch between hand reamers and side dilators. Basically, there is no real rule. You do what you feel the bone needs. Sometimes you need to cut a little bit. Sometimes you got to do a combination of both, cutting and expansion. And in this case, just needed to cut a little bit on the top. And then I'm going to expand the rest, and I'll take a 6 by 5.7. So the benefit of the floor transport technique is that I move the... Uh, floor of the sinus under control with full vision rather than through a small hole and I can mobilize it as much as I want and then I will still use the sides of the bone to hold our implant. <clears throat> and at this point I'm going to also use a, uh, a little bit of bone graft and the site um, the implant inserter retriever and finish it off with the Bicon <coughs> sinus lift abutment. The question from the live audience was, does the buckle plate ever fracture? Yes, if you're not careful, you can fracture anything. But the key here is to read what you've got and not to strain it. What is this? Shadi? Yes, sir. Can, can you hear me, Shadi? I do, um, I can. There's been a there's a question as about why you use um, the square technique instead of a trephine. Uh, I, I think that they're both the same, but a trephine will be cutting with uh, a higher speed, and it's a saw, and it will cut the, uh, the bone, the, excuse me, the membrane that I have no control. A square technique, it's a lot easier. You can hear, you can feel the bone better. Does that make sense? Thank you. Okay, so we're placing our implant. Again, use a slight uh, twisting motion to sort of escape the edges of the uh, rectangle. And now we'll tap it the rest of the way in. Are you okay, Arthur? Add more tapping. I'm sure you're used to that by now. Any pain? Yeah. Feel it in your nose? Okay. <laughs> okay, now we will put the uh, sinus lift abutment, which is this baby. Okay, the easiest way to hold it is with the suction. You have best control and you see best. And I want to put it with the widest part against the buckle and palatal. Like so, I can correct it <clears throat> if it twists a little bit. Okay. So what happens now, this is going to create the best stability for this implant because it's going to engage the uh, rim of the uh, osteotomy. This one. <clears throat> and there is a slight depression in the center that will allow me to use a... Um, a three millimeter point or nip 
to see that. <coughs> I'll give it some bone graft right underneath that because I will not have access to it again. Okay, I just put a little bit of bone graft there. And I'm going to uh, pack it in. Just make sure it's where I want it to go. Okay. Now this is too high. And it is stable still. Uh, uh, let's hope to keep it stable. As that. And the one thing is, because of the osteotomy being so wide, mesiodistally, bear with me, Arthur, that's it. I'm done with that, okay? Okay. A little bit of resistance here. That's it. Okay, good. So I'm going to take that. Some more. Oh. I don't need it. Okay, we're going to put some bone in to close off the anterior there and the distal part of the... <coughs> Doesn't need... Uh, Are there any questions? I didn't recognize you. Is there any, any questions? Yes. This is a surgical question. Yes. Yeah, uh, Pip, could you address it? When you're doing a sinus lift like this, it's a closed guys, technique. Guys, can we just have one conversation, please? You've only, can one um, conversation. I'd just like to ask that the technique involved in securing a short 6 millimeter implant, uh -huh. which is round in a square site or a rectangular site, yeah. when you've actually pushed that whole floor up, yeah. that, all that bony was tapping is now part of the apex of that implant. Yeah. And he fills basically basically sludge around it, which doesn't yeah. give him primary stability either. So I'd like to know how certain can one make to get adequate primary stability that you get osseous degradation, and are any membranes placed in a case like this? Um, you can of course place membrane at any stage. I'm not particularly fond of membrane, not being a periodontist, but <laughs> that. Um, what happens with? The uh, 6 by 5.7 in that area, okay, the graft itself, okay, with all of that membrane, and that's basically the best uh, guarantee that the membrane is still intact, is that it's bouncing back. Now, we have two ways of stabilizing it. If the uh, soft tissue were kind of thin, and if we don't have a good uh, contact with the... Uh, I actually finished. Can you have a bite on cause? We don't have contact over... Um, the um, um, sinus lift abutment, which is correctly identified as not round by Pete, is actually is oblong, and it's six and a half millimeter or more on, on its uh, longest uh, dimension. So this will sit on top of the uh, osteotomy, even if it were a round osteotomy, okay? And then what will happen over the next minutes or so, the clot will hold everything together. This isn't the first time. The, the one thing that you don't want to do, obviously, is have this implant uh, uh, under permucosal loading or something like that. But this is very thick um, soft tissue on top. And Pete was absolutely correct that the actual soft tissue coverage is going to give us the final immobility. Now, the, the putty, the, the sort of the jelly-like substance of the graft and the uh, bone, um, uh, excuse me, and the blood is going to, to act as the precursor for the integration of this implant. I also heard uh, someone asking about the crown to implant ratio, um, and I, I then missed the, the answer. If you'd like me to address that, I'd be happy to. Um, and um, and any other questions? Okay, We're gonna, I'm gonna switch rooms so we they can do the x-ray. Okay, Sean, um, question number one. Morning. Or good evening. Just, uh, what is the maximum height or uh, distance of maxillary residual ridge that you would advise using this technique in. So that residual ridge you've just done is two to three millimeters high. How, how much of a ridge do you, max, do you suggest you don't need to do this technique and do a normal closed osteotome technique? Um, I would say five millimeter or uh, four to five millimeter or more, depending on your skill and comfort level and the implant you use, obviously, if you, you should be using Bicon, because it's the best implant for this. Um, if you have four to five, you can use a, uh, 
the, in, the closed osteotome technique, the so-called closed, the, the internal sinus lift. Anything less than four, three millimeters or so, um, you can use the floor transport. Remember that as I was um, trying to push the, um, win the window into the uh, alveolus, it's actually compacting a little bit. So although it may start at three, it's actually more like two or one and a half millimeters. Okay, now the limiting factor, and, and I really don't want to spend too much time on this, but, but the limiting factor is not so much the thickness of the bone, is how much are you going to move <coughs> the membrane without risking tearing it? Because there's only so much you have control over from just the access through the um, uh, crest. Okay, so if you have already four or five millimeters of thickness, and then you're going to push them up eight millimeters, now you're trying to go almost like with a tent pole, pulling or pushing the whole membrane up something like 12 millimeters or uh, even more, or uh, at the very least 12 millimeters if you're gonna use a six millimeter implant. So you see, that is gonna be untenable and the risks are gonna be too high. Now with your skill level, you may be able to do it, but initially what you wanna do is find the area where the um, um, ridge, the crest, the buckle and palatal slopes are close together so that you can have buccal and palatal friction and immobilize your implant as I did before. And then your limit on the elevation, you choose the, the shortest implant without pushing it too high. And that's why it's successful. This technique was, is really made possible by the ultra short implants, the six millimeters and, and the five millimeter implants nice. from Bicon. Next question. Thanks for this. Thank you. Who's next? Sure. Guys? Please don't be shy. Put your hands up quickly. So Shadi, would it be of any use to use cone beam tomography in your planning stages for a case like this? Say that again. Would it be of any value to use cone beam tomography in the planning stages of this type of approach? Yes, there would be. There certainly would be a use, a significant use to it. Um, but after you've done a few, you sort of can and can read your. Um, panorexes and your, um, you know, the, the resistance that the bone is offering you. But yes, it would be of great value uh, to us to do that. Just a question regarding periapartitis. Um, can you please elaborate on how you treat that with a bicon implant? Given Peri Periimplantitis is not easy to treat anywhere with any implant. The, uh, the main reason for periimplantitis is the, the close proximity of the implant to the soft tissue covering. And as you know with Bicon, with its being uh, subcrestal or intracrestal, you have a layer of bone that helps you avoid that. Now, can you hear me? I don't know. If yeah. Oh, okay. And so... Yeah, we can hear you. And so treating it uh, with a Bicon system, thankfully it is not that common, but when we get to it, it's an aggressive treatment uh, and it involves decontamination mechanically with a diode laser and with uh, irrigation, hypotonic irrigation. And finally, we are now just uh, using some uh, grit blasting with um, uh, tricalcium phosphate, beta tricalcium phosphate which seems, seems to provide a very good uh, interaction for those, you know, two, three millimeters of the implant that may come in contact with the contaminated tissue. And we're finding preliminary results very encouraging. However, our sample size is very small, as I said. Please. Uh, guys, quickly, anybody? Piet. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we're just searching for the next one. Does anybody else want to? Don't be shy, guys. Crown refresh. Yeah. Um, I think the pictures was the question again. Ground root ratio. Yeah. You want, you want to know what? There are higher incidence of periimplantitis with a short implant. Uh, Shadi, is there a higher incident, uh, sorry, a higher incidence of periimplantitis with a shorter implant? No. Thank you. I mean, so I, you, want, you, want, you want to go and uh, have a very, very long answer to a short question. I can, but the short answer is no. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm just uh, I'm trying to see if there's anybody else. There's Christine here. What do you want? One second. Uh, could you go on about the crown uh, root uh, ratio, a little bit yeah, more about why, that? The crown root ratio. And why Bicon succeeds? 
Well, initially, you know, it's, it's counterintuitive, right? Every, like every one of your colleagues are, are thinking the same thing. And we would all admit, we all thought the same way. This couldn't possibly work. However, decades of eight millimeter long implants succeeding in the presence of over one and a half to one ratio, which goes against everything we know from dentistry, led us to, to think, well, wait a second. If that doesn't apply at this level, let's, let's see what happens. And so clinical uh, realities dictated that we end up with crown root ratios that are two to three to one. But also we followed that up initially, we, the study of the success of the implants over time showed that there was no difference between the ultra-short implants and the non-ultra-short implants. So we know that although these are loaded and placed in all kinds of patients that are not selected, they succeeded. So then we took it one step further to see, well, if an implant failed, was it more likely to have a high crown to implant ratio or no? And again, the results showed that there was no difference. So although the failure sample obviously is smaller, than the success sample, still it was statistically significant, and this paper has been published, showing that it doesn't affect the success or failure rate um, whether the crown to implant ratio is prosthetically or dentally unfavorable. But for implants, it actually works fine. The final thing is, well, what about longevity? What about long-term maintenance of this cre crestal bone? Which basically intuitively would tell you that, you know, if there is a significant a significance or a significant effect of the unfavorable or seemingly unfavorable crown to implant ratio, you would start seeing bone loss at the crest. And that again has not been proven. Actually, it shows that there is no correlation between the crown to implant ratio uh, and the maintenance of, of the crestal bone. In fact, we see just about uh, the same amount of bone elevation and growth on the implants rather than bone loss, irrespective of the, of the crown to implant ratio. And and when we're refining the sample, we're, we are now postulating that an actually higher crown to implant ratio is fa more favorable to the crestal bone. Now this lies in the, in the actual entirety of the design where all of these plateaus work together to stimulate the bone better, to resist all of these pressures, what, whether they be loaded centrically or eccentrically and still have solid bone maintained around the implant. Thanks, you Charlie. can see a, a lot um, of this. Is anybody? We do have the x-ray to show you, incidentally. The x-ray is up. <laughs> right. Don't tell me they're too close together. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> is anybody else like to, at this stage, would like to ask Charlie a question? Yeah. Lots of conversation. Just uh, so to close. Uh, when can you start loading them? <laughs> when can we start? Thank you. We, we will consider this a sinus lift, and in about four and a half, five months, we will, we will uh, open them to uh, take the impression. The, the, I know you guys are thinking those look a little bit too close together, okay? And the fact is, they, the bodies appear close, but the shoulder where the papilla lives, where the restoration is going to end up being affected, are far apart. They're more than four millimeters or three millimeters apart. And so that doesn't affect the restoration of the case. Invariably, because of the thinness of the, uh, the bone, and because if you look, can I show them here? If you were to extrapolate, if I were to extrapolate where the flap was and then the um, uh, window uh, is, my osteotomy ended up here because of the overhang to the mesial of the molar, okay? So we have to stay away from it. This um, very routinely happens when we're placing implants in this kind of uh, uh, proximity. However, this doesn't affect neither longevity, nor aesthetics, nor function because of the, sh the sloping shoulders, okay? So I'm not at all concerned with it. Okay, well, are you gonna wrap up now, Shadi? I, I am finished, uh, Dr. Morgan is here to say hello and goodbye. If you have any other questions, uh, please email us or call us. I'd be happy to talk with you. Thank you for your attention.